Good morning and welcome to Digimed TV. Uh, this morning's broadcast is on the subject of digital medicine for physical fitness, well-being and personal health management. Uh, before we go into a little presentation with some of the thoughts about how you use technology to improve physical fitness, well-being and personal health management, I just want to play a little video clip which tells you a little bit more about Digimed TV. Hi, my name is David Wortley. I'm the CEO and founder of 360 in 360 Digimed TV channel. And I'd like to share with you my vision for Digimed TV. We're living in a, a world now where coronavirus has really changed enormously the way in which we live. But with that change has come an opportunity to build a, a better world, a world which is more sustainable in every aspect, whether it's the environment or in particular with health. Coronavirus has highlighted the fact that lifestyle related conditions are placing a huge burden on our public health services and making them unsustainable. We've managed to control the situation to a large extent through the use of vaccines but it still raises the problem that many of us are at risk of poor health and of, at risk of getting the coronavirus because of our lifestyle related conditions like obesity and diabetes etc. They make it more likely to get ill and they make it more likely that when we do get ill uh, we will die. So one of the main objectives of Digimed TV is to create a platform to share ideas on how we can better manage health through digital technologies. So that's a little bit of a background about Digimed TV and our focus very much is on preventative health care. Uh, so now I'm going to share with you a presentation that um, I delivered quite some time ago at an international conference outlining some of the challenges that we face today and some concepts to illustrate how we can tackle some of those challenges. So today's presentation is about personal health management um, and a lot of this arises through some global lifestyle related challenges and you can see from the news article on the right which was um, written by Sir Simon Stevens who's I think recently retired of the, as the health of the National Health Service um, and he brought to our attention long before uh, COVID-19 the challenge of obesity. And what he said about it was that obesity is like a slow motion car crash that could cripple the NHS. And in a way, he was, well, he's been proved very much right, but not, not, not in the sense that he originally intended, but certainly with the uh, coronavirus, COVID-19, with the introduction of that into, into the country, those people who were obese and had some of the lifestyle related conditions were very much vulnerable um, and resulted in hospitalization um, and many of these people uh, died um, and finished up in, um, in, in, in intensive care if they didn't die. Uh, so we are in a situation now where our lifestyle challenges are really placing unsustainable burdens on public health services. Now, I'm, I'm going to pause at that point because um, I've just been joined in the studio by Jen Lowe, who's um, uh, joined us all the way from uh, across the other side of the, uh, uh, of, of the world. Um, and she's going to tell us a little bit about her story. And I'm going to use this to uh, illustrate uh, some of the points that I want to make. Uh, doing today's uh, broadcast. So uh, I'm going to bring uh, Jen into the studio now. I'm going to stop sharing uh, my, my presentation um, and 
bring her into the studio. So, Jen, uh, welcome. Uh, very nice to see you. Thank you for uh, joining me today. Um, uh, how are you? I'm great. <laughs> good, good. Well, uh, thank you for inviting me. Oh, that, that, that's a good start. Um, now, a little, I've known you for a number of years. And I, I, I think we possibly first met in Singapore at the uh, mm -hmm. inter International uh, Conference. And at that time, you were very, very active with uh, technology and your business. Um, and, <clears throat> well, you were a little dynamo, shall we say, um, with your... <laughs> with your with your activities so um but your life was about to make a drastic change so perhaps mm -hmm. you would like to uh, share that experience uh, with us and what happened to you when you went from this very very active lifestyle into something completely different shall we say yes david uh when we first met in singapore um I was just offered 50 million US dollar to take my company global. At that time, I was also working with one of the with one of the top five banks in Vietnam. I was about to start start up a digital animation uh, studio in Thailand at that time uh, to produce more uh, digitally animated videos for coaching uh, and leadership development and. Uh, I was invited on a trade mission to go to Myanmar when it just opened. Uh, and I was asked to speak to the whole financial sector uh, on uh, how to prepare for liberalization. And that particular seminar was opened by the, uh, you know, the deputy governor of the Central Bank of uh, Myanmar. So, um, you know, I, when I set up my company, it was to avoid traveling across continents because prior to this, when I when I was working for an international management consultancy, I uh, lived and worked across five continents. So when I set up my own consultancy, it was really to travel within three hours. But I find myself, uh, you know, very mobile, traveling to Japan, for example, and meet a client for business, and then uh, within. Uh, 36 to 24 hours, I was back to where to my, my next appointment. So I, I was a go-getter and uh, I was always on the move. I worked 16 hours every day. There was no holiday. Uh, public holidays didn't mean anything to me at that point in time. And uh, so, so I was running a quite a successful cross-border consultancy business. And uh, I'm a person who, a professional, an international professional, who is who is very used to steep learning curves. And uh, so because of that, I'm able to absorb, uh, you know, a tremendous amount of stress. I don't feel stress. I feel, <laughs> I feel exhilarated instead. So <laughs> by, by stress, by deadlines, by... And so if somebody offers me a project and say, this is going to bring you a lot of money, I wasn't so interested. But if someone says, this is so challenging, you know, I don't know whether you can do it. I say, I'll take it. So that's me before. <laughs> and uh, so having absorbed, uh, you know, tremendous amount of stress and not knowing that I was suffering from burnout because, you know, I'll always be on the move. So if there's some inconvenience, I'll just take an over-the-counter medication and just get on with things. So I didn't know I had burnout. Uh, and every three days, I would suffer from blinding migraine. I have to close all the window curtains and not face any light because I just couldn't, uh, uh, you know, couldn't see with the blinding migraine. And every three days, I need uh, a strong massage to get rid of the body aches and pains uh, that come out from nowhere. It's, it was such an inconvenience at that time. <laughs> and then, um, you know, I, I, in addition to that, I was suffering from uh, headaches, uh, migraine in between. 
And um, so, you know, I've been described at that time as somebody who is really, you know, the, the, it's like a very stretch uh, rubber band. <laughs> you know, it, everything has to be right on time, done, because so much happening. So... Um, yeah, I think we can. I, I I think I can identify with that. Not that I I I, I see myself as a as a stretch of a band, but uh, I I think um, we would describe it as being a workaholic. Uh, people who who um, live to work rather than people who work. To live, that's I think yes. how I've heard it uh, yes. articulated. So, you were placing yourself under an enormous amount of stress, and your body was telling you at the time mm. that mm. this is not going to be good for you. So, mm -hmm. what was it that triggered the 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 well, quite dramatic change in, in your lifestyle? Where where did you go once you? How did you realize that you needed to do something about this and, and what did you do about it? Um, well, I didn't know I had to do something about it. I worked with very, very smart uh, people, go-getters, and my clients were all top level, chairmen and CEOs of very large organizations. Uh, you know, so um, I, don't, I, I don't know, it just happened to me. I mean, you don't think about it. But when I arrived in Myanmar, which is a less developed country at that time, um, I noticed that it was a slower pace of life. People were happier. It was, you know, life was simple. Uh, and there wasn't that, you know, great motivational drive to achieve, <laughs> to go higher and higher. And about the same time, I was meeting with uh, top-level executives who confided in me as a coach, a leadership coach, that they, they, they reached a point, the top of the ladder, where they don't know what is next. They couldn't find an answer to what's next. And after meeting a few of them, I asked myself the same question because before that, you know, you're just so focused on what's next, what's next. And then you meet people who ask that question because... They've arrived. And when I look at those, uh, the people in Myanmar at, 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 whom I encountered, uh, including the monks, little monks, five to six years old monks, uh, who had very clear minds, because I, I, I out for fun, I volunteered to teach them. But I didn't know, they didn't even know the, the alphabets. So I volunteered to teach them English. Their minds were so clear. Um, and they could they, they could catch everything I said, and they were very calm and very peaceful. It struck me, and I thought, wow. So what I did was um, I went back and completed my projects, and then I found my smart employees, uh, good jobs with my clients, and then I temporarily closed all my companies. They went dormant. Uh, you know, and, you know, put away my three phones, <laughs> which I was on all the time. And then I, I joined them. I joined the little monks in meditation. And my first experience of meditation was uh, a culture shock to me. Because, you know, that was when I first realized everywhere I walk, because you're you're taught to you're trained to to feel your sensations. There was a wall of fire following me everywhere. That's the only way to describe it. It was a wall, a flaming wall of fire. I think. And, and, I and think well, they, this was in Myanmar. So you closed your businesses it's down. Like, it's stress. I didn't know, but it, it mm. was like a flaming wall of fire following me everywhere. Um, because it was a silent retreat. Um. My mind was like a traffic jam with multiple tracks, planning and organizing what I should do and how I can escape all this silence. <laughs> because I had to face myself, David, <laughs> you know, all the time you're talking to people. And then suddenly you have to face yourself and the quiet and the stillness of your mind. And it's really hard. So, 
when I first started, I plan I was planning all the time how to escape. <laughs> ah, to escape. okay. So so you 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 were you were trying to to to, to escape, but yes, this 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 after that experience, how did things change for you then? Um, you talk about this initial experience, which must have been quite uh, distressing for you to uh, have a wall of fire following you everywhere. Um, how, and, and at the time, you were just being a leadership coach. You were teaching other people how and to lead. And, yeah. a, and, a, and a management, management consultant. consultant. So, mm. so how and did this... Strategy. Yeah. So, Sorry. how did this this transition take place? I, I'm I'm picturing the scene now with with you with these uh, with these monks um, in a in a very tranquil environment. So, how did the journey there progress? I can't explain it because I just decided it was the right time, and I cannot even explain it. And nobody knew where I was because uh, I was not accessible. I, they took away my all my phones. I have a number of phones, <laughs> and uh, and I had to be silent, not just look down and just meditate. Um, it was a huge, huge change, and um, distant memories. The mind cleared after a while, and distant memories. Uh, of what life was like before I became a consultant and coach, came back. And I remember I was a go-getter and I was always on the move. And so when I started my consultancy after coming back from London uh, and not having to travel continents as I said just now, I, I started my company when I was looking after my mother who was veg in a vegetative state. So, um, so in between, meeting clients and and looking after my mother uh you know when she when she passed on i didn't cry no just get on with things and then i look after my father uh every weekend uh after i've come back from overseas every monday i'll fly out somewhere uh and every friday i'll be back and i look after my father who was by then uh suffering from Parkinson's disease and he wasn't well. So um, I also look after my father during the weekends. So when he passed on, I didn't cry. Maybe a little, but you know, all these emotions were suppressed because it was just about getting on with life, getting on with the business. <laughs> and when I meditated, all these suppressed emotions came up and childhood memories came back. So it was quite uh, revealing for me, I would say, a revelation for me because uh, suppressed emotions well into tears. Um, I started to feel again. So sense, sense the feelings that came up and so on. And all the, the Parisian cafe type of thoughts that were tumbling all over in my head, inside my head, it's kind of cleared traffic jam cleared and my mind was very quiet and what I find it was was that you don't have to you don't have to work all the time you need you need that you need to take care of your health your well, mental wellness cultivate and strengthen your mental you know uh, mental your mind you don't need to be, uh, you know, on the go all the time to be productive. And that's what I discovered. And because I was always mixing with top level people and, uh, you know, uh, very high achievers, leaders and so on. Uh, for the first time, the change in my lifestyle, mixing with what my accountants say, common people. <laughs> because I used to call up after, I came, you know, in between the the retreats i used to call up my accountant and said I, I i i can't i can't take it because i'm mixing with people i don't understand uh so she said you're mixing with common people okay so learn learn to simplify your life uh and so uh, that was transformational for me 
Yes, I, I, I can imagine it was transformational. So you were in the mountains with these monks, and how long were you there? And, and then what happened when you uh, had experienced this journey? What made you decide to come back to, well, not your old life, but clearly but you, you've learned from your experiences. So uh, tell me about... Um, the, the point when you decided that um, this you needed to then change your life uh, again and come back to uh, what well I won't use the word civilization but uh, come back <laughs> to to a, a different the world that you knew before shall I say uh huh um, well I didn't plan on it turning out to be four years full time so from working sixteen hour days. I jump into 14-hour meditation, intensive meditation retreats. Um, as I mentioned just now, the first time I did it, the first weekend I did it, I was planning how to escape from this, from placing my mind, my own myself. And then it just went on until four years, four years, full time. And uh, I wasn't ready to leave. Uh, I actually began to appreciate the quiet life uh, and the, the inner peace, the inner peace, and uh, um, letting go of the need to, the overdrive need to achieve, to get on to the next curve, because I was in technology as well. So it's getting on to the next, next curve, be on top of it. Letting go of all that was very peaceful. Uh, but the monks told me to leave. They actually told me to leave because... Uh, I progressed to a level of insight. It's the, the, the kind of meditation I practice is called insight meditation. I've practiced to a level because I was very focused and very serious about it and very committed. I progressed rapidly over the four years to uh, a level where they actually advised me to leave and uh, contribute to society because they said that uh, when they interview me on my meditation experience, some of the insight they've shared, they've not heard from anyone uh, meditator for, for the 20 plus years that they have been teachers. Uh, and one of them actually turned around and asked me, how did you meditate? So I said, I followed your instructions. So basically, they are the ones who advised me to leave and they asked me to contribute to society. Uh, and so... Um, I tried, I did try to go back to my past life, I would say, yeah, uh, because you think that, you know, you just go back to what you, you did best, but it didn't work out. It didn't work out for me. Uh, uh, and, um, I went, I came, uh, so I, I left and I wanted to understand more the theory of things. And so, uh, I decided to do research into uh, mindful leadership, which is what I'm doing right now, halfway through, and the wisdom of things. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, wisdom. So you, that's the key. So, so you're you're passing on your the knowledge of your experience on to uh, to, to to other people. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm I'm sure there are many senior executives who can identify with this uh, with the pressure of working at that kind of pace. Mm -hmm. you know, people mm -hmm. at that kind of level are often extremely driven, um, mm -hmm. and you know I I would describe myself as a as a, as as one of those people who who is. Um, very driven. I want to achieve things in my life, and uh, so I'm up at uh, seven o'clock every morning, I'm, and I'm into work within a few minutes. Um, and I eventually finish my day probably about five five thirty in the in the evening, and then I make a meal for everybody in the house. and uh, uh, And it's only then when I uh, sit down and and and, and I relax. Um, so. You know, I, I, I haven't suffered from migraine or any physical problems. And I think part of the reason behind that is that um, I do make sure that I get um, some physical exercise in the morning. So I do a five-mile walk every morning. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking that it's probably that, that walk 
when I walk through the countryside and mm. reflect on my life and all the things that are, are happening around me um, mm. in a very calm, reflective way uh, mm. that probably helps me to manage this this conflict between mm. um, a high-paced modern world and um, and you know the other extreme which you've uh, mm. uh, which you've uh, experienced so um just tell me now a little bit about what you're what you're doing now you're doing um, some leadership on on mindfulness training how do, how does that work okay i'm actually doing research into uh insight meditation the theory behind it how that leads to wisdom and how that applies to leadership uh, well, uh, recently I had the chance to uh, coach uh, senior executives uh, during the pandemic. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, you know, regional managing directors have to face challenges uh, that they've never faced before. Uh, and, and, you know, I was asked, how do you apply meditation to what I do? Um, and also, I've been asked, because, you know, one of them is American, he said, you know, uh, you know, when you're top executive, people tell you what they think you want to hear. How do I know? Especially in Asia, where everybody says, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Actually, yes, in that cultural sense means, yes, I hear you, not necessarily, yes, I agree with you. So they ask me, how do I know? So that's when I say, you need to learn how you need to learn how to sense sensing and uh uh under listening at a deeper level than what than just the words the words that are said or not said the undercurrent the underlying emotions so um you are right in saying that the walks in the morning are very good the quiet walks um if you take that to a higher level meditation which is what i'm researching on the link between meditation insight meditation and wisdom and i'm actually studying greek and chinese wisdom through the ages to see if there are any parallels and there are lots of overlapping uh you know wis wisdom insights there to how do you apply that to modern life uh especially in this age <laughs> not just pandemic, but in this age, uh, digital, post-digital age, where everything is very uncertain. Things can just suddenly appear and disappear. And, uh, you know, it's so uncertain, it's so complex. Things are connected, not just uh, sequentially, you know, but also vertically. So there's so much complexity and uncertainty. So how you, you need more than just quiet time you need the wisdom to deal with all of this yeah i i, I can i can understand that so um not all executives uh, would would uh, be able to or willing to go to a monastic uh, retreat yes. <laughs> so how can you how can you do this in your modern world and uh, yes. i have to ask this because the program is about uh, digital medicine, um, mm. and uh, from what we've been discussing, uh, the the digital technologies that we're familiar with today are are actually contributed to some of the problems that you've uh, mm. identified with. Uh, mm. So um, I, the the two questions there really. What one is. Uh, what kind of advice do you initially give to um, senior executives and people living a high stress life to be able to make this transition to, to something which uh, will lead to greater insight and, and wisdom? And the second question is, um, are there any uh, technologies that are emerging today which can help people to, to make that transition? Um, I will answer the second question first because that's close to close to what I'm doing now. Uh, I'm setting up a, a, an online digital uh, service where we where we would um, train senior executives uh, in uh, in that insight meditation. You don't have to go to a monastery, 
However, sometimes we, I may invite you know a monk to come and give a, a talk, and um, so it will be digital. You can uh, you can access it. My website is there. Uh, it, it's just been created, and um, you can access it. I'll be putting out uh, sessions where uh, you can uh, be guided on this wisdom uh, insight meditation. So it is available there. Now I answer your first question. Uh, my advice is to avoid having your mind further stimulated. I've noticed in your earlier uh, sessions uh, some of the some of the technologies that were that are introduced to help with health management, uh, health and wellness. They actually further stimulate the mind. And uh, what you need is quiet, that space in your mind in order to cultivate uh, wisdom. So uh, I'll be happy to share my some of my uh, you know uh, feedback with directly with your other uh, guests to to help them better understand how to apply. Um, so I'm also back to the part where I would like to create. Uh, Digi digitally animated cartoons, which I was about to start uh, before I disappeared. <laughs> and um, these cartoons would help people understand in a facilitated, facilitated uh, kind of uh, mindset change. Because many people are especially senior executives are not willing, that willing to accept that they're stressed, they're facing stress. Uh, you know, in fact, it's, it's kind of like, um, you know, the hallmark of being a leader, you can take a lot of stress. So um, mm. my idea is to have that uh, cartoon for them to project their thoughts, their concerns, their worries, uh, so that uh, we can have a, a chat about that, a conversation about that. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Yeah. Does that answer your question? Well, yes, That's it goes part of the way. It goes part of the way to to answering uh, the question. So you're you're developing this uh, website, which is uh, designed to help people to uh, have a greater insight and to be able to uh, 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 to meditate. A lot of the the digital medicine solutions that, that I I talk. About, out are um, in my in my view designed to really help you give get a better insight into your own health um, and the way that I would articulate this is that um, you know when you go to if you go back in time and now now I'm going back back in, on a journey to my my own youth um, <clears throat> when you go back in time um, you visited the the doctor um and in in a sense i i i can see how a doctor might like might be a little bit like a, a monk uh, because he has some <laughs> basic tools and he talks to you but he understands you as a person i mean going mm -hmm. back in time this is you you spent some time in the surgery talking to the doctor and he was listening to you and he combined what he heard from you uh, together with the the readings of his stethoscope and uh, blood pressure meter and all of the rest so he would then become to know you as a person um and and because of that he can prescribe almost a holistic solution so it's not about um, prescribing drugs all the time um, it's about um, a combination of this medical insight into the physical state of your body mm -hmm. uh, but but also related to your lifestyle and I think uh, today this is uh, because of the pressure of life uh, this is missing from um, <clears throat> from medical practice today doctors do not have time to spend mm -hmm. half an hour 
uh, talking to individual patients. Um, and today, with coronavirus uh, and telemedicine becoming more uh, the norm, very often these things are done remotely and they're done with locums. They're not done with the same doctor that you've seen and known for years and mm. years. They're done with a complete stranger who may only have some written notes. Uh, so mm. that's someone uh, that, that doesn't know you. So um, a lot of the things that I've talked about with digital medicine are looking at ways in which uh, digital technologies uh, can help to understand the whole you which is a mixture, mm. a mixture of the, the, um, the vital signs, you know, blood pressure, temperature, all the rest of it. Um, mm -hmm. um, but, but also, I think increasingly, um, uh, looking at being able to understand your, your mental uh, condition. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we, we are now moving into an, uh, an era where possibly through the kinds of um, cartoon animations that you're talking about, um, where we can help to uh, generate that, that mind mindfulness. Um, so right. what, 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 would you, what would you say about that? Um, I, I enjoyed listening to you and your, your thoughts uh, because they resonate with me. Um, there are actually two levels. One is the meditation, the insight meditation. And I'm not talking about the kind of meditation that's popularized in the West, uh, where it's about stress reduction and, you know, being associated with, uh, you know, near break, stress, near breakdown kind of situation. I'm talking more, I, I'm talking more about high level executives, senior executives, entre successful entrepreneurs who are not, uh, mentally imbalanced or near stress breakdown they are they 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 do they they are able to manage their life so far right balance it um, and these are the entrepreneurs and top executives that i'm look i'm talking about when we say in insight meditation because it's it's not about stress reduction it's about wisdom the wisdom to balance your life your mental faculties right the connection between emotional, mental, and spiritual, because you get a lot of psychosomatic illnesses out there. And uh, that's one part about wisdom meditation, this, the insight meditation. The second part is where you get to talk about it. And um, the cartoons that I have in mind are actually to prompt you or, you know, uh, to talk about what's on your mind. And you it's like, like asking the executive or entrepreneur, uh, creative entrepreneur, to project their thoughts onto a blank canvas. So the cartoons will stimulate their thinking uh, in a way that it's like not stimulate as in make them, you know, all excited, but more to say, uh, you know, I see myself in that and, um, and to talk about it. A little bit like a psychologist, but but uh, the cartoon is is kind of like a robot, you know, that it's just working. It's just like a silent movie, you know. So it's like. Oh uh, yeah, I yeah I, I, I get Jenny the Chaplin. picture now. Yeah, I get the picture now, and uh, uh, you know, and, and I can see that. Um, and I I know of people who are uh, working with the, the the use of technologies which measure your brainwave uh, activity. Um, I think some of the most interesting examples of that are where uh, you can take the signals from your brain which relate to your level of concentration and your level of relaxation and apply that to a, a scenario. Mm. Um, so um, just one example uh, of a very early example of um, someone working in this field um, he's, a, he's an entrepreneur, very much like you, but his background is in psychology, but he's also had a lot of experience with, as a, a, a movie maker. Um, oh, great. Uh, and, and so he combined um, both of these uh, experiences to um, create solutions where you use um, a, a headband like 
uh, it's called Mind Play, uh, which measures your electrical brain signals. Um, and he uses that to create um, narratives and stories that you can mm -hmm. influence the outcome of through mm -hmm. your brain signals. Um, and the one, the one, one early example, uh, and I, I, I'm not sure it's a good example, but it, it illustrates how, how it works. Um, uh, and that is, he created a, uh, an experience or a movie uh, uh, called Exorcism. Um, and, and, and the storyline the storyline was that uh, you are a world famous exorcist so this is a role playing exercise which is very often used in in the kind of uh, uh, psychology that, that you've been talking about you put a person in a position that they're not used to and, and, and then they play the role to act out um, the situation so you this this movie is through your eyes so you are the exorcist uh, and mm -hmm. you have been called by your friend who's absolutely out of his mind because his girlfriend is behaving very strangely <laughs> and um, so he says you are the only person who can solve this so the movie starts where you are driving through the night with the rain coming on the windscreen uh, to your friend's house. Um, the car pulls up, you get out of the car and you see your friend there looking very worried and, and, he, and he says, oh, thank God you've arrived. You, you're really the only person who can help me. Um, and so you go to the door and as you go to the door, it swings open. He, he's told you that his yeah. girlfriend's locked herself in um, uh, but as soon as you arrive, the door swings open and you go inside and then the door slams shut behind you. Wow. So your friend is, is outside, you are inside and it's all dark and it's candle lit and you see a figure sat in the chair rocking um, gently with um, uh, a voice that you would have one of these horror movies that said, I'm so pleased to see you. I hope you <laughs> bought your little box of tricks. So, David, this, you must the, do a voiceover. <laughs> well, yes. So his girlfriend is is in this chair, um, and so you go into the room, um, and you try to get rid of the the demon. Um, and if you are if you are successful, you see the the the, the woman. Uh, with this ghostly mist that comes out of her when the demon goes, um, and then she starts speaking normally again. Um, and then you go into the next room, um, and your friend is there, and the demon's gone into him. <laughs> so, so you, you, you then have, this is the end of the the movie. The, you are then described as an amateur exorcist. You need to do better. Uh, and so what, what happens is that your, your electrical brain waves uh, take you down a path. So the movie is filmed with several different outcomes or several different stories. And depending on whether you are relaxed or uh, whether you're, you're relaxed and you're focused, you can have the best possible outcome where you everything is achieved. But, but if you are scared by the movie, if you're distracted by what you're seeing, um, then the outcome is bad. Now that was a, an early example, and the problem that I saw with the, with it, and the problem that I had with it at the time, uh, was that um, there was no way really for me to tell whether I was I was relaxed or concentrating. You know, I couldn't I couldn't see. I know I was trying hard to be relaxed and focus, but there's no way that I got the, the feedback to, to do it. Now, I know that um, uh, the company in the USA now who um, uh, are also working in this field, they have a company called Helium. Um, um, and, and, and so they have taken this to uh, another level now, which um, I think from what I've seen, um, has quite some chance of um, being successful in helping people to make the transition that, that you've had, uh, is to 
understand um, and to be able to better manage their their thoughts um, and control uh, their, their their mind. Um, mm. And and I know there is a, a difference between being able to focus and, and and relax but i think i see that as a little step down the journey to mm -hmm. having better insights because if you are able uh to recognize your own mental state to understand your own mental state um and to have ways of being able to manage that i think together that that brings um I say it's a step on the journey towards um, um, insight and and, and wisdom. Um, mm. Now, now moving on to you know where we are David, at the moment. David, yes. may I comment on that? Because yeah, sure, please. Use, yeah, sure. Yeah, you use certain uh, key words that I would like to respond to, and one is that the insight meditation that I practice actually encourage people to look at their mental state. Uh, as it arises, not just when they're going through it. And the second point I want to say is that, um, yes, uh, you know, psychologists and psychiatrists, they like to measure the brain and the brain waves. What I like to point out is that there's a difference between the brain, which is, uh, which is matter, an organ in the body, matter. It's matter, physical matter. There's a difference between that and the mind. And when you practice meditation, you will clearly see the difference between the brain and the mind, right? Uh, and the third thing I want to say is that, um, you know, the mind is intangible. It is the forerunner of all realities, so in, including your mental state. So if your mind is not stable, especially during the pandemic, uh, it, will, it will create your own realities, just for your information. Uh, because of the pandemic that's been so long drawn out, people, lots of people are suffering from mental health issues. They're not normally, you know, people with mental illness. They're just, their mind has just gone off <laughs> because it's, it's too much to handle, you know, the uncertainty, the complexities of things and the fears, the fears that you talk about in the haunted, you know, the, the exorcist. These are the things that people have to handle every day for the past one and a half years. And that can really set, you know, can really create your own reality. And the other day, I had to deal unexpectedly with a suicide case. Somebody who was normally uh, one, two years ago, uh, very cheerful, happy-go-lucky. And, you know, they've, they've just, the, depre the fears have just gone into deep set this person off into severe depression and uh, in their mind they've got all these ghostly figures, uh, scary figures in their mind the moment they close their eyes. So um, it's in the mind, you create your own reality and the mind is different from the, the brain, that's what I want to say. Yeah, and I, I understand that, and um, uh, you know, I think you're ab absolutely right with that, and that was actually leading me on to my my next question to to put to you, and that is the impact of uh, of, of coronavirus and COVID nineteen, uh, because if you particularly with first responders, people working in the health services, having to deal with um, uh, with life and death and people seriously ill, working at high pressure for long hours all of the time um, yeah. during the pandemic. Um, um, I, I can see like a huge snowball that is uh, building up and building up that um, when we get to a more stable situation and have coronavirus manageable i don't think it will ever go away um or if it does there will be other pandemics to uh, uh mm. to, to follow um so what happens when when people have had all of this stress and then all of a sudden they find that it's that it's gone uh, i mean i i draw a parallel here between your own situation where you were working under high pressure and high pressure and high pressure and then you went to a totally different environment where all of that was 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 taken away and actually it was a a revelation uh, for you and it was a transition mm. which has, mm. has been very very positive 
Uh, mm. But I can think of everyday examples, and one of them is um, uh, something that I've observed with my friends who are teachers. Um, you know, teachers uh, work during uh, term time, and very often they fall ill as soon as the holidays come along. Uh, because, <laughs> really? Yeah, because they... Yeah, because they, they, they have, <laughs> they've been working under pressure and, they, and then mm. all of a sudden their, their, their body is, um, you know, their body and their mind are placed in mm. a different situation. And mm. it's almost as if to say the body says, the mind says, oh, thank God that's over. Now I can be ill. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, that, it, well, it's like that. that. Yeah. And, and similarly, I, I would say the same uh, about people who go into retirement, people who've had uh, mm. lives, whether they are manual workers or whether they mm. um, are, um, are, are brain workers, uh, mm. you, they work until you're 65 and everybody says, mm. oh, isn't it wonderful? You can stop work at 65 and you have a pension and you can begin to enjoy your life. But for many people, this is a death sentence almost because they, mm. they, they go into a world where almost they're no longer needed. The things mm. that, that occupied them and kept them going and gave them a, a reason to live and a reason to get up, they're all taken away. And mm. many people in that situation find it difficult to cope. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's mm. very often why um, people uh, die before their time is because of this mm. situation. Uh, and I was thinking about it this morning, actually before the program, about the difference between men and women. I mean, talking about in the, in the developed world, um, mm. the life expectancy of a woman was significantly higher than that of a man. Mm. Um, and it, in my mind, um, you know, I began to draw a connection between the fact that um, a woman uh, in, in a normal domestic relationship does not retire. Mm. Just because mm. her husband's finished work, she still does mm. the housework, she does the shopping, she does the daily task. And so her, her routine, in a way, continues and she's not got that kind of cliff edge where suddenly one day you're, you're not working. So, so I think um, having... Uh, having challenges and the right level of challenges the right kind of challenges can actually help uh, you to uh, remain physically and mentally active throughout your mm -hmm. life um, and, mm -hmm. and run less risk of falling ill when you're older um, mm -hmm. um, so that, that's my observation I think you you're really quite exceptional in in the sense that you you were all you went you had this very high pressure and i mean it was extreme from the way you described it you're working longer <laughs> hours than most people and at the same time dealing with the, the problems with your mother and your father um managing all of that juggling all of those balls all the time and traveling all of this and then all of a sudden um you, it's, it's, it is a cliff edge. You go into a monastery in the mountains, <laughs> no electricity or, or water, um, and um, <laughs> you know you, you came out of that, um, and you've got this insight and wisdom which you're now um, you're now passing on to other people. The only the only uh, the only experience that I've had that comes anywhere near close to uh, what you're describing was. Uh, when I was um, invited to uh, Korea, um, mm. and um, I, uh, I I visited a, a, a very good uh, friend, um, and he took me to a monastery, uh, mm. which was like a, a, mass, a monastic retreat. Um, mm. And so the the room that I had, um, well, it was just completely empty apart from a futon. Um, there was just a, a, a mat. That you laid on the floor, um, no pillows, um, mm. nothing, just just a mat. And, and at half past four in the morning, um, you would hear the sound of the monks uh, yes. ringing the bell and walking yes. round and, yes. and, and, and chanting as their day started. Um, and then when 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 I when I got up, um, 
everything was communal. So uh, I was sharing the shower with the other monks uh, in, in the morning. Um, and the, the quite bizarre part of the experience really was that um, I, was, I was there to do a webcast uh, or a webinar. Uh, so in this monastic retreat, they had a computer which had high speed access to the internet uh, and we did a, a webinar um, with my with my friend talking uh, very much about the same things that we are that we are talking about now. So uh, you know, I only had one night uh, in this. <laughs> so you didn't was, have to plan, your, strategize your escape. <laughs> no, 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 I didn't. I, I, I didn't. But um, you know, it was a, a little taster of the the world that you've uh, been uh, been describing um mm -hmm. and um so coming back to uh, uh coronavirus um you know what do you think we can we can do you know just to, in the, in terms of helping um to deal with the uh, with the stress management and um, all the other things what what can we do to try and address mm -hmm. that First of all, I would like to relate it to your topic today, which is about health management, personal health management. And um, I would like to relate it not just to, uh, you know, executives and entrepreneurs, but also to the pensioners that you talk about uh, and to uh, the people who have to suffer, you know, lockdowns and so on during pandemics like COVID-19 and those who have to go through trauma, you know, of seeing friends and family, uh, uh, dying, you know, and also the frontliners, not just the health frontliners, but the teachers uh, who are there, you know, facing uh, all these uh, stresses. So in all of these different groups, what's most important is to understand that the suff to understand with your mind uh, that the suffering is out there. There is a way right to face this suffering the suffering means different things to different groups of people in the in the in in the in, in that category of pensioners that you talk about there's no longer any routine to go to work there's no longer what they think is a purposeful life where they go to work and they're productive and so uh what do they do what does life mean for them from now on you know because before that a purposeful life means working a productive life and now that's it and 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 with uh with the uh health frontliners all the suffering they've seen i would i would think i would feel and think they're suppressing the the trauma right now the suffering that they see it's all suppressed but when it stops it's going to come sweeping over them like a tsunami of negative emotions and, and memories of all that they've witnessed, you know, and all they've held back, it will come. So um, it's very, very important from a personal health management point of view to strengthen your mental culture, right? Personally, you don't have to go to a monastery, don't have to do, you know, you, 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 uh, there's, you can do it yourself uh, through guided, inside meditation and it's not about stress reduction uh, or about uh, suppressing your you know, stealing your mind it's about gaining wisdom to face all the challenges in life at every stage any stage of life every stage any situation because in you know it's not going to get easier in the, this is my research in the post digital age it's not going to get easier it's just going to be evolving very very rapidly everything all phenomena so what you need is to to practice it doesn't have to take long it can be just half an hour every day morning or night to to practice like a gym this is a mental gym where you strengthen your mental muscles you, it's a self-cultivation process for mental wellness. So then you're able to face any challenges. Whether you're a billionaire, I mean, we've read about billionaires who jump who jump to their death 
or, or you know, the other day somebody just whom I don't know, but I've heard a bit too late, they've just hanged themselves because of the crisis, uh, personal crisis exacerbated by the pandemic isolation. So if you practice uh, mental cultivation, you can do it. You can face any challenges. Well, I think that's a, a wonderful way to uh, conclude today's broadcast. And um, I really enjoyed our conversation. I want to thank you very much for uh, joining me to, today, uh, Jane. Uh, I just want to conclude by uh, just giving a little preview of this afternoon's broadcast and the speakers that we uh, that we have. So thank you for, thank you. for jo joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you David. I've enjoyed the session. Good, excellent, thank you. <laughs> so this afternoon we we have um, uh, four, five guests actually, um, and they're covering quite a spectrum of different experiences. We have uh, Ben Wilkins, uh, who's the CEO and founder of Good Boost, and he's going to be talking about the uh, the work with using gamification and technology. Uh, to support people with musculoskeletal disorders. Uh, Wes Pooley is going to be talking to us about genomics um, and the, uh, the, the services that are provided by his organization, Mudo, that, that help us to understand better our genetic makeup and to adjust our physical and um, diet uh, regimes to give us the best result. Lucia Panese is joining us again, and she's going to be talking about the V-Care project. Leon Ison, um, again, he's a, a previous guest of my program. He's a CEO and founder of Oxytone. He's going to be talking about wearable technologies and personal health management. And finally, we have a behavioral psychologist in the shape of Ron O'Donnell, who's a clinical professor at Arizona State University. So I very much hope that you will get the opportunity uh, to join us this afternoon um, at 3.30 UK time um, and listen to what our guests have to say. So thank you once again to Jen Lowe joining us from Singapore and thank you to those of you who've been with us on this broadcast. Thank you.